Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Let us begin our next session, Valerie Chains. And how can we scale best practices in the region? So we have outstanding speakers. We have two governors, regional governors, who have a lot to tell about contribution made by their regions to technological progress and in setting up and structuring value-added chains and scaling that regional experience. We are talking about Vladislav Shapsha, governor of Kaluga region, and Igor Artemonov and the chief administration, Lipetsk um, Oblast. We also have the pro-rector of, of the Academy of Foreign Trade, Mrs. Volchkova, and Dmitry Komisarov, who is the chairman of the board, Transmash Holding. I moderate, happen to moderate the session, and the president of the Russian Union of Industrials and Entrepreneurs, Alexander Shokin. If we compare the title of our session in Russian and English, you can see that the word differently, the title is worded differently, because, well, the Russian part offers to scale value change and best practices, whereas the English version uh, uh, offers a question of whether this value change is needed at all for Russia and for its individual regions. I would rather ask our speakers to take both questions on whether we do need and your regions need those value chains and whether they contribute to industrial development, and if yes, how can we scale best regional practices? Well, this topic is an old one. It is very deeply rooted. I remember I once um, uh, participated in a session of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and our Russian Union is an associated member. And we discussed the contribution of small businesses and industrial cooperation in broader sense. And we discussed that as a leading topic. However, many associations were shutting down during the pandemic and even before the pandemic. And we do recall just when many industrial facilities started to get back to their original seats from Asia-Pacific regions back to the United States and to Europe. And import substitution or localization is often treated by some experts and our overseas experts as an attempt to replace the involvement in value change into the naturalization. At a time of pandemic, many of them cashed in on this decision when there were some hitches and perhaps during supply chains and they could rather launch domestic production of components. So this is a, still an outstanding issue. And Natalia Alexandrovna, I would like you to set the ball rolling. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander Nikolaevich. Uh, what are the change. Well, this is a much touted issue. And we need to properly understand what this is. This understanding is different depending on who you are talking to, whether you are talking to governments or the corporates. And we are, we are normally talking about the import of component parts and the export of finished products and services abroad. And there's a linear connection between the, uh, you know, the elements of the chain and all the links. I believe that it is important from the perspective of the overall export activities of a country. Processing, manufacturing, upgrading of goods and product, uh, products and services. Apart from that, there's also a second part of the chain. And specifically, the export of goods and services abroad and exports to third countries. So, for Russia, well, 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 there's no problem with the second part of the chain. The export of natural gas or wheat contributes a lot to our revenues, to our budget revenues, adding up to 30 percent of overall export proceeds. Whereas the first part, unfortunately, is a kind of a lame duck. Uh, well, this 
is a chain which begins with the import of services, component parts, the upgrading and their improvement. And this is something which is a good part of the rapidly developing economies. Unfortunately, in Russia, this amounts to 10% or less in the, of the Russian budget. And if we are involved in the overall links in a fairly nice way, 30 plus 10 percent, meaning 40 percent of the value of the chain, however, we are suffering from the abundance of natural resources. Why is it important at all to upgrade well, the links of the first part? import and subsequent export. Let me tell you something about our research, which will hopefully tell you why we need to place an emphasis on those validated chains. When we look into Russian companies and when we compare export-oriented companies and domestic companies, well, the former would be 32 percent more productive than the latter part. If we look at both exporting and importing companies, then these companies are 85 percent more productive than net exporters those who do not import at all, meaning that there is a large margin. And we are talking about the economy of scale at the end of the day. This process requires a lot of investment in the proper structure of the lineup of products, um, exports, manufacturing, servicing, and post-sale servicing, something that does not actually depend on the actual output of a manufacturing facility if we distribute them, spread them out in the entire uh, chain, then we'll see that sophisticated production and the competitive advantage will depend about the amount of sales market. To set up a production from scratch, starting with R&D and all the way to post-sales services within one company is, is surely impossible. I believe we do not have sufficient resources to produce a motor car from scratch and then to offer post-sales services. The, this is just impossible. Well, there are inverse uh, uh, validated chains, import, starting with import and all the way to export. This is something that enables us to produce a number of components and then to supply to the rest of the world. This is something that assures competitive advantage. So from the perspective of business, involvement in value-added chains is only natural way of increasing their margins and competitive advantages. So from this perspective, perspective, this chain is not an end in itself. We're just talking about the proper involvement in the world market. Nothing more than that. And from the Russian perspective, to increase the amount of exports other than raw materials to 70 percent without those value-added chains would be impossible, impossible in a physical way. On the other hand, the digitization and increase of investment in logistical chains would create a fertile ground for uh, the sprouting of those validated chains. Why are we talking to regions about those validated chains? Our research demonstrates that those chains, their intensity and their active posture hinges on four factors. First, uh, those, the, the, the factor, the production factor of a territory, uh, services sector, the services play an important role. They, they add up to 60 percent of the value of those change. They're very intensive in terms of their margins and institutions and business climate, business environment. These two are very important indeed for those value added chains. It is essential also to heed the costs of running business 
in a specific region, in a specific city or country, including both um, transport, logistics, and also regulatory burden. Our research indicates that our regions are very heterogeneous. They are very unevenly distributed in terms of the business environment and business climate they offer. Those regions that are represented by their governors are most interesting examples of successful business practices that facilitates the involvement of Russian companies in those validated chains. Thank you, Natalia Alexandrovna. Uh, we are about to start the discussion of regional practices and Vladislav Valerievich, a question to you. It is known that Kaluga region, um, it is famous for the assembly operations and of course they are part of the global validated chain and Minister Manturov, speaking at the Gaida Forum, said that the automotive sector and other machine building sectors, mechanical engineering, should focus on component manufacturing. So it would be important for us to understand where we should use this localization ratio criteria or where we should actually lean on value-added chains because our market is not as large as that of China and we need to think about export activities while, of course, uh, while, of course, busy increasing the localization ratio. So your experience, the local region, is most interesting. Uh, so could you tell us more about those value-added chains and how you are involved in the overall process and how this helps or impairs the situation of Kaluga region? From the perspective of what Natalia Alexandrovna told us in terms of the institutional framework and the business environment and everything else, why should businesses choose to stay with you? Thank you. I would like to follow up on what you have mentioned and um, toss in a few examples. We do not have ample natural resources in Kaluga, and for many, many years we tried to soak up investment, domestic and foreign alike, and we have built around 120 large production facilities. Auto, the automotive sector, Volkswagen, branched out to us back in 2006, a year after they actually they started their Greenfield project, together with three other concerns, Volvo, Volkswagen, and Mitsubishi, and Citroën too, they have built 30 plants and facilities to supply component parts to those assembly operations. Some time ago, they were all designed to sell domestically. However, in the meantime, they managed to become part of a global value-added chain and Fairglass, a Chinese company that uh, sells uh, all windshields to Volkswagen is a number one company, glass company in Russia, and it exports up to 80% of its products. A company that produces wheel, uh, wheel, wheel, wheel tires, Continental, uh, export, has exported over 20 million tires uh, last year. Volkswagen itself that built a, a, an internal combustion engine facility is ranking third now in terms of its production output. Well, these are the good examples that new facilities incentivize the further growth of value-added chains. And in terms of the GDP, it is uh, composed by 10% of the automotive sector products. We are talking about 50 billion rubles. You also mentioned how the business environment could affect or help the region. 
это большая работа. Otherwise, our effort would have been futile, because we need to place some new greenfield projects in Kaluga, Kaluga, which has never hosted any facilities of the kind. We used to, to have a lot of defense factors, nothing more than that. We uh, invested billions of um, budget funds to actually to train and retrain people, to intensify them, and apart from assembly workers, all the way to engineers. And we're working together with technology universities with their branch office in Kaluga, and we offer them classical education, the so-called dual education, on, on hands-on hands training. In 2016, uh, at, here at Renepa, there's a contest of regional teams that offered their projects. Kaluga offered a project to build a new campus of the Bauman Technology University, and it was awarded the Grand Prix. I believe that in a year or so, we'll have a bright new campus for 3,000 students, university students, and uh, the faculty, people so much needed. We also have another example from the pharmaceutical agency. We are ranking 12th in terms of the export of medicines. Uh, we actually started that Greenfield project in Obninsk. We actually started it from scratch, and now we have dozens of companies operating there, um, producing 160 different pharmaceutical products. Uh, together with Novonorsk and AstraZeneca, there's a full cycle, facilities, all the way from producing active ingredients uh, to uh, finished products, to finished forms. 30-plus uh, percent of TV sets and monitors are ex produced in Russia are exported from Kaluga region, and 25 percent of washing machines. Well, this is all an indication of a substantial success of the companies thanks to the policies we pursue. Washing machines. When I visited the special economic zone in Lipsk last time, I was brought to that washing machine facility, and we discussed that, uh, their involvement in the global value chain. That was about the first example. Uh, in um, machine building and manufacturing sector and uh, cooperation with uh, foreign investors. And the Lipsk Special Economic Zone is still a good example of the efficient use of that tool. It appears that some time ago the government decimated the number of special economic zones because not all regions made use of this good opportunity. However, Lipetsk was amongst the pioneering um, regions of the SEZ. What do you think? How can this tool be effectively used to ramify and extend value change? Okay. The Lipetsk Economic Zone is known as one of the most effective, one of the best in the country. We normally uh, compete with the Lamborg and Tatarstan. Well, they win over us one year. We take the prize back next year. Well, several criteria in use. And one of the major criteria is the choice of investors and why investors make their decisions and who wins and who loses. We understand, we realize that this is all the result of reputation and teamwork. The Lipetsk economic zone. Well, I have to say this. Uh, the best advertisements goes mouth to mouth. 
And a lot of investors from Italy, United States, Israel, Germany, and others are already operating here. And they recommended it. It's word of mouth. And they like working with us. They like it there. Originally, the Lipetsk Economic Zones was established as a manufacturing base for the NMK. They needed it. They needed some properly manufactured products and metals. No. So it began. However, uh, later, this got over to tire production and uh, potatoes for McDonald's chains and coffee, munitions, well, uh, a lot of different facilities. And munitions? Are you making it, um, them part of your global value chain? Uh, well, well, since the NLMK, the Novolipetsk Metal Works, is also president of the, 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 the rifle sport. <laughs> yes, in that sense, yes. But we won't talk about those sniper rifles, aren't we? No. We have two anchors, two fundamental anchors. We are talking about the Lipetsk, Nova Lipetsk, and everything related to metal works and um, the farming sector. The second base is in Yeletsk, everything related to food processing and uh, pesticides and herbicides. And this is something that helps us follow the path we originally chose and keep on with our export-oriented facilities, our yeast-producing factories working for the Asian market, unique logistical chains, uh, power resources, infrastructure is in place. We got everything to meet our objectives. And every year, we are building five to seven new production facilities. However, we believe that every new facility should complement the existing ones. Say the Indesit factory, and people are all keep talking about localization. However, the outstanding issue is that we do not have enough proposals from domestic manufacturers, component manufacturers, something that is in demand. And the Russian government needs to incentivize the acquisition and construction of new assembly lines and new assembly facilities. So does it make a difference of where a given factory is located, in Sweden or in Brazil? It is only a matter of technology and proper training and also building logistics. So by making use of this opportunity, I hope that the Russian Union of Industrialists will look into that and perhaps uh, come up with, uh, with an offer. Thank you. Thank you, Igor Yurush. Dmitry Georgievich, it's your turn now. No matter how you try to kind of to sway and, and, and avoid the tough questions, the sanctions, how do they affect those validated chains? The geopolitical uh, intricacies, how do they restrict our partnerships with international companies? It is known that Transmash Holding used to work actively with Alstom and keeps working with it after the merger and acquisition plans and also about competition. What do you think about the need for everything in place for a good business environment, for logistics, for skilled labor? How can you work together with international companies in terms of transport vehicles? 
And what are the prospects? And what about the prospects for your involvement in those chains? Well, you ask so many questions. Let me try to give you a short answer. Uh, we are, in many of those links, we are the company that partly imports, exports, and manufactures. Russia is the, ma the main sale market for, sales market for us, together with other post-Soviet republics. Hungary, Bulgaria, Egypt, too. In terms of your question about sanctions, we do not feel those sanctions sharply. Uh, we are designing our products ourselves. We don't depend on any third-party licenses or some other R&D. This is something we do ourselves. Component part supplies. Yes, indeed. We have experienced some of the sanctions from an amazing country named Ukraine. And they probably imposed those sanctions to their own detriment because there's no other place they could sell their products. But that's their own business. As to how we sort things out, look, in this large world, we have managed to localize key component parts and key products. We went for the localization for a number of reasons. First, we wanted to be independent, and we want to control prices and quality. Uh, import. Import is also important because the, it means an inflow of hard cash, especially with the ruble rate fluctuations. These fluctuations would have affected us had we not gone for domestic production. Also, export opportunities. Unlike many other industries, we have an advantage of large series of production and large production scales, meaning that we can save on the economy of scale. Since we design our products ourselves and we adapt it for the needs of our customers, we occasionally receive requests of adapting or integrating important component parts into our products. We do that no sweat. Yes. Well, like transmissions, uh, uh, electric motors, and uh, diesel engines, we can do that. And we do that. Uh, what was said about the production outside and, future, uh, and subsequent exports, we are learning to do that. We are working with Egypt via exports from Hungary. So we acquired a manufacturing plant in Hungary, final assembly operations in Hungary, and it is Hungary that exports to Egypt. We also set up post sales services uh, for our trains in Argentina. So, I hope I have um, responded to your question adequately. Okay, round two. And it appears that one of the more important questions, since we're talking about best regional practices, is, Natalia, a question to you. What's the responsibility of the regions? for the e e expansion of the valid chains, and what's the responsibility of the federal authorities? Talk about the automotive sector. It is known that our ratios for assembly operations are used to alter. And we started with the WTO requirements, and then it turned out that we infringed on the WTO regulations and we started compensating for some extra expenses that were not subject to WTO 
uh, restrictions. So it so happened that many of the projects that were designed to get us involved in those validated chains depend on federal and regional regulations. How this responsibility terms of reference are distributed amongst them? Yes, indeed. This is a very good and very important issue. And decision-making centers and the way decisions are made can affect the competitive advantages and competitive status of a project. Whether an investor would like to shell out money for a project, in terms of federal terms of reference, everything that is related to the trade regime certification and well because we're talking about sophisticated production processes it is their capote the federal authorities uh, federal authorities sometimes do not understand all intricacies of those validated chains particularly when it comes to exports. So these chains are special in that a chain uh, multiplies trade expenses. Because we're talking about import. We are imp we import everything, then we upgrade parts and we subsequently export it. And then out of the 5% of the customs value, 50 plus more percent would be trade costs. And this is only import tariff, but there are also tariff uh, barriers, including all the certification related issues, origination rules, and so on and so forth. So uh, the trade policy plays a much higher role in the value chains uh, than just uh, trivial import and consumption within the country. In value chains, uh, it complicates business life substantially. So therefore, the assessment uh, of the tariff policy, which, uh, by the way, is not uh, even a responsibility of the federal center, but uh, goes up above the national level, should be thought out very well and coordinated, negotiated uh, with the Eurasian uh, community countries uh, so that uh, the uh, change should work well. Uh, within the country, uh, uh, trade policy is also very important. The customs, uh, it affects uh, the cost of imports and also uh, the uh, uh, balance of the tariffs, uh, which unfortunately is very far from perfect. For instance, uh, the, there are production schemes uh, where uh, the protection of components is much higher uh, than uh, the one applying uh, to the end product. Uh, fiber optic in Saransk uh, is one of the examples, and that creates uh, a considerable uh, problem uh, for the competitiveness uh, of uh, this production in the worldwide market. Uh, so the trade policy, uh, or better to say, the consistency of trade policy uh, is very important. Our government, for some reason, decided, uh, has decided that in trade policy you can make decision from minute to minute. Uh, today, uh, for instance, uh, we'll assign uh, new uh, excise fees, uh, not even thinking how it affects the business. And for business, it's very uh, bad uh, because uh, it means that in a minute uh, you can uh, go from uh, black to red and so that's a risk uh, for investors actually standing the way for investors uh, to uh, invest. And, uh, of course, it goes against uh, uh, the national goals. That's about the federal level. Now to the regional level. I have a very good case. Vyacheslav uh, gave one about Kaluga. Uh, he spoke about the efforts that the region uh, is investing in uh, creating uh, the, the uh, talent pool. Of course, uh, I was uh, talking uh, about uh, human resources in the first place. So for the change we're talking, uh, feedback, uh, 
uh, chains. So it's not the natural resources, it's human resources. Because it's production and services, uh, it's uh, what now forms the talent pool of the country. It's a very good example. Uh, it's a very small country, Costa Rica. Uh, it's not comparable to Russia, but it's quite comparable to Russian regions. So uh, in this country, the problem of export uh, diversification, by the way, it was a natural resource country. 60% of the exports uh, were uh, vegetables. So in five years, uh, the export uh, structure uh, changed radically. And now uh, electronics uh, started to account for 30% of the industry. Why? Uh, because uh, they brought Intel into the country. Uh, they uh, built uh, fab, fabs that, uh, at which conditions? Well, all those Caribbean countries, uh, they're all tax havens. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm uh, leading there. Uh, when Intel was looking uh, for a site in Latin America uh, where to uh, build a fab facility, the first thing that Intel uh, did, even before they made a decision that they would invest, you know uh, whom uh, they met first in this country? It wasn't uh, the uh, Ministry of Finance. It was uh, heads uh, of universities. So he brought together the heads of universities, and they decided the education curriculum. But there's one peculiarity. Costa Rica uh, is uh, believed uh, to be uh, the most environmentally uh, beneficial country, and the, the happiest country, yes. But uh, this is very important. It wasn't uh, the government. It wasn't the Ministry of Finance. And by the way, uh, they weren't requesting any tax breaks for themselves. This is another uh, peculiarity of investor behavior. Uh, they weren't asking for themselves. They were asking for uh, the policy change in the country for all investors. Uh, uh, because, uh, you know, if uh, the government makes a decision in favor of one investor, it can be revoked. But if the decision has been uh, made across the board, covering everyone, uh, it is very uh, difficult to, uh, to be revoked. So the educational curricula should uh, meet uh, the level uh, of uh, skills uh, that modern production requires. So in this uh, sense, I fully agree. And I think uh, that uh, this experience of uh, improvement of, of improving the educational level, uh, specifically in these technology areas, is a very important element. But, of course, uh, this is not everything. Uh, for the services, for the entire range of uh, B2B services uh, that uh, the business uh, requires uh, to bring the costs down so that these uh, services uh, could be purchased at a lower price in the market rather than internally. And this, of course, uh, will imply involving investors in the sector, uh, so, uh, in the service sectors. Of course, uh, coordination is needed for that. Logistics is needed for that. And the role of the regional authority as a coordinator uh, that uh, could bring together the interests of uh, different industries and their own interests uh, to develop the region. So uh, it's extremely important. And of course, uh, of paramount importance, and it's also been mentioned today, Igor mentioned that, uh, is that you need to bring investors in, you need to talk to investors, you need to create incentives for them uh, to uh, arrive in the region. And it's also the responsibility of the region. Of course, uh, the federal center can bring in a very uh, large investor, but they're not doing a good job there. But if you want uh, to get investors in the value chain, of course, it's, it's only you who can do that, I mean, in the region. Thank you. Uh, I address my question uh, to our governor speakers. Uh, so replicability. Uh, where uh, can uh, some universal conditions be applied that can work in any uh, region? But where is an individual role of a governor as the driver for change? Like Just like Natalia says, uh, the uh, regional leadership uh, should uh, take up uh, the role of coordination, uh, meaning to say that it's not uh, just uh, about uh, the uh, production uh, ecosystem, uh, but also some additional services and other things uh, needed. So perhaps uh, not everything can be replicated in a simple way. You see, uh, these things don't exclude uh, one another. Uh, the role of the personality in the future, we need to talk about the role of personality in the future. 
Yes, uh, but look, the role of the governor and the resources uh, that are available in logistics and infrastructures, these are things uh, that overlap uh, quite a lot. Well, however, however good a governor uh, could be, uh, but uh, no infrastructure uh, would be in place, uh, uh, it's a situation that's very hard to overcome. Uh, so, for instance, uh, we invite investors, uh, what do they uh, choose? Of course, uh, they choose uh, areas uh, where they, where somebody has already tread before them. Uh, for instance, uh, we have this competition with Alaboga in, in Tatarstan. They go to come to us, to Lipisk, to Alaboga, and some other economic zones. Uh, but if there's a green field and just one factory there, it's very difficult to do. However good uh, the uh, leader uh, might be, it's difficult uh, to compete with established zones. Because when you arrive and instead of, you know, a bare field, uh, you see the whole infrastructure, uh, people know what it's all about, uh, people know how to deal uh, with the customs, there's energy. Uh, and today uh, we are working on our investors uh, to be able to know, you know, take Porsche, you buy some car and there's a kit. So you come in, uh, choose uh, the uh, basically the components of the car, uh, the roof, uh, the uh, floor, the trimmings, and so today uh, we can uh, offer them the same. So you can virtually build a factory in our economic zones, uh, you can select the capacity, uh, the configuration, and it's very comfortable, it's very attractive, and I think it's going to be in high demand. So perhaps uh, some adjustments uh, can be uh, made, uh, uh, some adjustments uh, may uh, can make one uh, region different from another. So, uh, some, some insights, uh, small or large, creating convenience uh, for the investors. They're very important, and this is uh, the role. Whereas in the uh, playing field, the, uh, it's very difficult today. Yes, I will agree. But you've already built so much uh, that you won't even find a, a blank field. Uh, well, there are some. Uh, talk about the tools uh, that are being used today. Of course, uh, they evolved a lot. And largely speaking, uh, well, if we traced away from the ind industrial parks uh, that they had in Kaluga, uh, all to industry zones in Lipex, uh, they're quite universal and understandable. Uh, they have of legal support, and you can't find any big differences, but there's a big difference between a uh, blank field and history. It's uh, the responsibility of the regional authority uh, for uh, the commitments they've made. And uh, there are lots of examples. We're all aware about the, uh, aware of them. Uh, so, for instance, investor arrives, they're being uh, promised the infrastructure, something like that, and then uh, two, three years elapse, uh, and uh, the infrastructure structure uh, is not yet there. And then the investor goes away. Uh, there have been many examples of that. Uh, and this, again, is a factor uh, that uh, makes one region look differently from another. And uh, so here, it's very important uh, that you meet all your uh, promises. And that will generate trust. Uh, that will build your history. And, uh, that will make sure that people uh, will keep coming to you. Uh, because, you know, even the Companies uh, who come to us, uh, they come to us and say, we've been told in the embassy uh, that you can do business with these guys. It's important. And of course, the HR component. So if there are four universities in the region, uh, one is regional level and three federal level universities, it's a huge advantage. Being able uh, to uh, train uh, professionals uh, based on the requirements of the companies operating in your area is a big advantage uh, to uh, become attractive uh, for the investor. It's important.
Governor, dear governors, uh, there's a real uh, there's a real problem of competition for the investor. An example, so hydrogen. Uh, automotive industry uh, or um, uh, electrical powered vehicles uh, are going to be on the rise. So are you going to compete uh, with those companies who want to build hydrogen, hydrogen or electricity powered cars? So the question is really uh, not uh, who uh, will uh, take them away. Well, I would look at this differently. Look, we've had discussions about that, and the colleagues were saying that in the past uh, they were citing the example of Singapore. Uh, there was a time they said that they were happy uh, to welcome any investor, but then uh, they uh, started to become to be picky, and we are now at a phase where we're not uh, absolutely happy uh, to see any investor. Uh, we understand that the region has uh, two fundamental values: that's excellent arable land, land uh, that is going away that we don't have left uh, to spare, and uh, human resources that uh, start provoking certain concerns in terms of uh, being substantial, sufficient. And so competition uh, for uh, human resources uh, starts to get uh, more and more uh, fears, and if we want to uh, supply uh, uh, human resources for the industry, uh, we understand that we're soon getting into a situation of shortage. Uh, so we are looking of the complementarity of the regional economy and uh, the requirements of a new investor. And here we have to do this kind of triage uh, to uh, select those who are of interest to us uh, and from from those who are not. So if uh, they just want to uh, bring their costs down, uh, well, they're not of much interest to us. But uh, if uh, they want uh, to I have uh, uh, higher quality human resources than they are. Same thing about the environment. Nikolai, uh, when uh, you are uh, choosing a region uh, to place the production of your components or others, what are you uh, looking at in the first place? A relationship with the governor, uh, the complementarity uh, between your line of business and the regional economy, availability of HR, everything together. Well, it's ob ob obvious uh, that it all works uh, together. It's been rightly said today uh, that, uh, uh, largely speaking, uh, production facilities can be deployed almost anywhere. Uh, so uh, what uh, are actually uh, the uh, turn-ons or turn-offs, uh, the presence of the infrastructure, of human resources, logistics, how much it will uh, cost you uh, to ship there and from there. So perhaps uh, these are the three obvious things. As uh, to the value chains, colleagues are saying, the colleagues are saying that, and I think uh, that uh, we uh, should uh, make a distinction between different uh, value chains. Uh, if we're asking uh, someone uh, like uh, VW uh, to the country, this is one thing, because a value chain uh, can't be an end in itself. Uh, it can either be a tool or a way to organize something. Uh, so as uh, to the size of the value added, this is an important thing, uh, the interest of the country uh, to uh, improve, the, in, increasing uh, the value within the country. That's another thing. If you invite for a VW here to export to other countries, that's good. But if uh, the end of the value chain uh, is the consumer here, then I think uh, it's uh, by far worse uh, than if it's uh, totally Russian production of the Russian IP, because some of the countries like VW are going to uh, export from this territory. Uh, 
Well, uh, most uh, just want to sell here uh, rather than uh, export something from here. So this, uh, in this sense, uh, for the right value chain, it's important to support, uh, support uh, what we also say. The Russian uh, producer, uh, it's about creating uh, incentives for the Russian uh, manufacturers, especially those who have their own IP. As uh, to the uh, value chains, uh, they will be just a tool. Let me mention that we're talking about the participation of Russian uh, regional companies in uh, global value chains. We're not talking uh, about supply chains as such. It's indeed quite a simple thing. You uh, bring in something, uh, you assemble, and then uh, you sell right here. It looks like a supply chain, uh, but we're talking about the participation of Russian regions in creating uh, the uh, added value. Uh, it's about deprocessing. Uh, it's about involving uh, the service industry. So Natalia said that uh, best practices say that up to 60 percent uh, of uh, all the value add uh, account is accounted for uh, by uh, the services. Uh, and even if applied uh, to um, raw materials intensive uh, regions, uh, deep processing is also uh, playing a more and more important role there. And by the way, well, perhaps uh, we'll need to wrap up after that. Uh, it's uh, no coincidence that the title of this national uh, project uh, includes the words international collaboration uh, in export support rather than just export support. I think this international collaboration is utmostly important, uh, especially uh, in uh, these pandemic conditions uh, where supply chains have been disrupted and also uh, sanctions started to be implemented uh, on a broader basis. Uh, we can't uh, just fall out of these global chains and uh, not only uh, because uh, they help uh, Russian uh, companies and regions uh, to achieve their uh, economic goals, but also it's because it's the only way uh, to stay at uh, the high technology level, high performance level, high productivity level. Uh, so, Natalia, I'll give you the last word for the comment. Uh, thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Very important and exciting. In fact, the question uh, that uh, we uh, started with, how to scale, it's the key question for us. Because without scaling up uh, these successful regional practices to those areas where there's still a lot uh, of empty fields, uh, this uh, is a crucial uh, thing, because unless we can do that, so we won't achieve uh, the national goals, because the resources are there, but they're not packaged correctly for the investors so that uh, uh, they could uh, come here, I want to come here. Uh, the year 2000, Kaluga. We uh, were estimating uh, the implications uh, of uh, joining WTA, uh, and we're modeling uh, the regional development. So Kaluga was one of the 10 regions uh, that was expected uh, to suffer the most uh, from uh, WTO uh, uh, accession. But uh, in 10 years, Kaluga has become uh, one of the, reader, uh, of the leaders. So in just 10 years, uh, the situation in the region has so changed. So, but they had fields. Yes, they had fields. But, you know, uh, some fields uh, are positioned better than ours. And also uh, the uh, decisive role of the uh, governor. So, in Kaluga, in 2010, uh, the uh, field was uh, uh, broader. Okay, colleagues, I think uh, this is a, a topic uh, that requires additional discussion. Indeed, the question of how scalable, how re replicable are best regional practices, all the more so that these best practices are there. The governors are happy uh, to share how to achieve uh, these results. And of course, one of the aspects that are important is that they're actively lobbying, uh, creating a federal regulatory framework. So, so 
so that uh, beneficial conditions uh, should be created uh, not only on a regional basis, uh, but also countrywide. And it's no coincidence uh, that your predecessors uh, in the Council of Federation are dealing with that by uh, trying uh, to build or create uh, good finance and tax conditions for the development of the region. Colleagues, I'd like to thank you for the participation in this session. Uh, please continue the discussion at uh, the uh, Russian industrialists' uh, uh, site. We have lots of uh, working bodies uh, that uh, can help you, and we can also uh, be instrumental uh, to you promoting your ideas in regions. Thank you.